Wealth with Homer Smith. I am your host and moderator, Ryan Ruff. It's always great to be with you guys. And of course, we have Homer standing by. He'll be jumping aboard and joining us in just a moment. We're going to be unpacking another wealth management related discussion. You guys know that's what we tackle here on the show. Uh, but look, let's face it, we're living longer. And to frame things up for you today, while living longer does have its advantages, well, there's also some great health and financial challenges that come along with it. And today, we have a really special guest that's going to be joining Homer today to dive into this idea of longevity planning and what it is and how it plays a role in your health as well as your wealth moving forward. That guest being Dr. Dan Carlin over at World Clinic, really going to be focusing on seeing you know, the health impact and what wealthy families are doing and also maybe not doing uh, in order to make sure that their wealth and their health are in tandem throughout this concept of longevity planning. So that being said, first off, let's go ahead and get Homer out here and get today's conversation rolling. Homer, good to see you this morning. How are you doing? I'm well, Ryan. Thanks for uh, being back. Looking forward to this conversation today. Yeah, absolutely. Homer, you and I were talking off off camera that this is just a, a prominent conversation that's popping up more and more with clients these days. Uh, and, you know, we're really excited, obviously, to have Dr. Dan Carlin joining us today. So, Homer, with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and throw things over to you and uh, you and Dr. Dan. You can have a great conversation today. All right. Thanks, Ryan. All right, Dan, uh, really excited for you to be joining uh, me today. I know we, we've spoken a number of times over the last uh, number of years with uh, clients and also just a number of the events that we've been at, at together. So uh, excited to have you and, and just appreciate you uh, joining us today. Thanks. Thanks, Homer. I'm glad to be here. All right. So we're going to cover you know a few topics today, uh, particularly around you know why wealthy families are gravitating to concierge medical uh, services, as well as how that's impacting uh, longevity. Um, in, in their health picture. And, you know, I'll, I'll touch on some of the, you know, kind of the wealth management topics that related to that, but I'm just really excited to have you here as the expert um, on the health side. So but before we really dive into all of that, um, I think it'd be helpful to get a good understanding of what the world of concierge medicine in general, you know, like we run into a lot in our world, you know, wealth management, you know, family offices, you know, no matter who you talk to, they're going to have a very different definition of what that means. And I think there's a lot of similarities in the concierge medicine space because there are so many di different ways to approach it. Uh, so I'd love to get you know, your background, uh, your approach to concierge medicine, and, and also just your view of kind of the entire world of concierge medicine and the different ways that you see uh, uh, wealthy families and business owners approaching that. So I'd uh, love to give you an a, a opening just to kind of give a general view of that from your perspective and, and more of an intro on, on you and, and World Clinic. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm an old physician now. I'm 62 years old, finished medical school a long time ago. But um, I've been caring for affluent families now for about um, going on 20 years. Um, my roots are interesting. I had a very circuitous path as a young physician. I was a naval officer, and then I was a refugee camp doctor, and uh, but always interested in technology. And I'm, I'm boarded, by the way, in emergency medicine. So if you went back 25 years ago, I was one of the first guys to get into telemedicine. But back then, it was more of a fringe, tiny little corner of medicine. But the client base for telemedicine, circa 2000, were super yachts private islands, remote stations, ranches, um, basically the residences and places where high net worth families were living, recreating, uh, occasionally seeking solitude. And, and that's where I sort of made my bones. I was taking care of super yachts and taking care of these very remote places using uh, back, back then, where we'd even call it kind of primitive telemedicine, but it worked. And I set up a model, uh, medical practice model to take care of an affluent family, multi-generation, and multiple homes anywhere in the world. And I've been leveraging the internet ever since then to deliver physician presence, infrastructure, key resources, logistics, provider networks, you name it. But the mission hasn't changed. I'm on call 24 hours a day. Uh, one of our patients has a problem anywhere in the world, and they get me or one of the physicians in our group in, in about one minute and five seconds on phone, on video. Um, it's been a, an extraordinary journey. Um, so, so Dan, on that, to go even a little bit deeper, uh, with the story you tell, or at least I've heard you tell about kind of how it all began with one um, one sailing boat. Um, I think it was a sailing boat, I can't remember if it was a what? super yacht, but, yeah. but um, kind of how you helped save a life and kind of really kicked you off into this. How did, how did that fit into that? Yeah, so not many doctors will say I'm here because of the Guinness Book of World Records, but I am. 
1998, I used the internet, which back then it was a bit more experimental than anything. I used the internet to instruct a Russian solo sailor in, uh, in, a, in a sailboat race called the Around Alone. And it is exactly what it sounds like. You sail around the world completely alone. Anyway, I needed this gentleman to operate on his arm to save his arm. He had a horrific infection and needed to be opened, drained, control the bleeding, start antibiotics, everything. And we had lost voice communication with our patient. So this was all email on a ComSat C terminal, text email. And uh, it was challenging, you can imagine. Um, but it was I was not unfamiliar with it. So I wrote this surgical procedure like a uh, recipe for making a pan of brownies. Collect your equipment. Put it on the table from left to right. You know, step one, wash your hands. Step two, sterilize your elbow with iodine. Step three, cut into yeah. this infection deep and fast. And uh, my patient survived. He actually became something of an international celebrity. Uh, and I did too for about for about two or three weeks. Uh, I, I was the a little, bit more, guy, so. a little bit more than uh, baking some brownies, but a uh, pretty powerful yeah. story. <laughs> The, the, yeah, the, the concept uh, in terms of communication is quite similar, yeah. um, tried and true. Uh, the outcome, obviously, quite different. And in this case, it's very favorable. So that's a very, obviously, uh, intense uh, story and version of how concierge medicine works. Um, as we kind of open this up, there's a lot of different ways people think about it, hear about it, learn about it. In, from your perspective, what, you know, what are the different kind of levels or ways people can approach and access concierge medicine? And then, you know, how World Clinic and what you've created, how you've evolved it and how it fits into that world. Yeah. So concierge medicine is a big term, unfortunately. Um, and I want to break it down for you. Uh, there's basic concierge medicine, which in concept means I pay a membership fee or I pay a, some type of private fee to a physician practice for either additional care, additional access, um, higher levels of personal service, if you will. Um, there are commercial chains that are quite good, like MDVIP. Then there's an upper market change, uh, chain called MD Square. Um, the price ranges from a couple thousand a year to 50,000 a year for a family. Um, these are geographic entities. And by that, I mean, for the most part, the physician's office is the center of the practice and you've got to be in that locale to access the practice. The physician will answer uh, off hours phone calls, et cetera, but it really centers all the way back to that particular office in that particular city. These are quite good for families that are residents of a single place or don't travel a whole lot, don't have a particularly mobile lifestyle, or, and or they need higher levels of personal interaction. This is quite true for, for older patients north of 80 years of age. They, Telemedicine is tricky. Um, they generally require a bit more in-person uh, presence, if you will. So think about it this way. You sort of have the office-based model, and there's high and low end. Um, and then in the world I'm in, we're sort of a distributed medical care model, which is we start with access point, uh, which is virtual, either phone, video, email, text, uh, you name it. Um, but you're, it's is a virtual interaction that everything starts with, and then all subsequent downstream care events are organized and, and executed. So if you think of it in those ways, so there's sort of two models. One is on the ground, one place, one office, and then there's a distributed model, which is 24-7 anywhere in the world. I'm in the latter category. Great. Um, I think that's very helpful because, again, I think it, it is confusing when when a, I have a client come to me and say, hey, I'm really interested in concierge medicine. And it's like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> when, right. by, what are you really looking for and wanting? And and so I think that's a helpful start. I, I think uh, maybe another way to think about it um, or frame the benefits of concierge medicine, whether it's your model or or more of the, the localized model. You know, we were on a call with a client recently, and I'll obviously keep the details to a minimum, but um, he had just recently had surgery. And uh, one of the side effects that came out of the surgery was a, a pretty severe skin rash. And the story he was telling us as we were listening to him was, you know, multiple, multiple trips back to the doctor hospital. Um, a lot of uh, specialists and generalists sitting around together talking um, all about what might be going on and nobody really solving 
um, uh, for the problem and, and really identifying what it is. And I remember the, the client mentioning in the background of one of these conversations, one person mentioned, oh, maybe, maybe he should talk to a dermatologist since it's on his skin. And nobody said anything, nobody did anything with that. It was actually the, cl the client insisting that he speak to a dermatologist. And finally, after weeks of this pain and trouble, um, you know, the, the problem finally got resolved. But, you know, in whether it's world clinic or maybe concierge medicine in general, how might have that experience been different um, for that client? Sure. So so I, I feel bad for that client because they uh, what happened to them is quite common. They, they fell into a small group of physicians who are trying to figure out something that was outside their expertise. So a good concierge physician, whether in the office or one of someone on my team, you're making a presumptive diagnosis. I think you've got X. And lo and behold, I'm wrong. Yeah. Well, now you find out how good your doctor is. If he's quick to admit he's wrong, off track, or this isn't going according to plan, then a good physician is going to say, let's bring in some expertise. Um, in my world, that, that case you described, dermatology is quite good uh, in terms of using telemedicine. So that would have been a series of let's take some photographs of this rash. And we do this routinely every day just to make sure it's going in the right direction. You know, is our, is our treatment effective? So in a case like that, if, it, if we were wrong or we would misdiagnosed or we weren't getting it right, the, the pictures would have told the story that we haven't achieved success here. And at that point, we would have um, we have consultant dermatologists and we would have brought them in. Um, and even at that point, if we were really not confident in just dermatology, we might have brought infectious disease in or even rheumatology. There's a series of really weird rashes that rheumatologists know. But my point is, be quick to admit you're wrong and then bring in the right people to expand the brain base around yeah. this particular problem. I feel bad for your patient because they kept the brain base too small, too limited, too long, and your patient suffered. And I think what he was referring to a lot was that they were trying to figure out what might have gone wrong with the surgery or something related right. to the, the surgery itself, not right. the skin, yeah. which, you know, it wasn't anything to do with, with what they were looking at. Um, it took them too long. Yeah. So um, so that brings up a good point about speed and, to service, right? And I think with a lot of the clients that I work with and, and obviously the ones that are interested in working with you, time is their most important resource. So, you know, tell me how you design world clinic and and again how i think it relates to um, the type of concierge medicine you focus on how do you work with your patients to get them some time back and, and that valuable resource sure sure um if you go back to sort of the roots of world clinic it was very much about emergency medicine my training and uh, my time overseas i thought well i'm just going to create a virtual emergency room um and it's fast you know it's 35 seconds uh till you're connected with someone who cares and then it's a minute and five seconds and you're actually speaking with a physician and many times nowadays we convert the call to video but our roots were emergency medicine get a doctor now we got a problem now somewhere in the world one of our patients is in trouble and let's solve the problem and you know it worked really well particularly among the ultra affluent because their currency if you will and i use the term loosely their currency is time it's not money anymore it's time. How much time am I going to devote to this problem, issue, or concern? And how quickly can I hand it off to someone who knows what they're doing and is going to solve it for me? That is the fundamental value proposition that you have to bring to the table with high, a high net worth client. They have a million assets, but their most precious asset is time, followed closely yeah. by money. But that, that's, where we, that's where this idea of an immediate access to the person who's going to solve the problem that, that's a compelling value proposition in high net worth. And I think going back to that client case we talked about, I think he mentioned eight, 10 trips back to the doctor, wait times, phone calls, all of that, that maybe could have been solved in, in, in a few, couple hours of better diagnosis. Um, so that was, that's one example. Um, I'm sure you have hundreds, but maybe a couple of other examples of where um, the value of a service like yours has either saved time, saved money, or saved lives um, by having the access to, to concierge medicine at the level that you provide it. Sure. Um, here's a case, and it's drawn right from the world of high net worth. So we had a, uh, a spouse of a primary client 
um, they're family members now. But at the time, this was an unre- you know a, a spouse of one of our regular uh, executive patients. Anyway, she took a fall out in, in Aspen, Colorado, while she was skiing, and a pretty good fall. Um, but bounced right back up, helmeted, did great, went to lunch. And over lunch, she noticed a wobble in her visual field. And by that, I mean, she noticed that there was a waviness to what should have been a nice, clear visual image as interpreted by her brain. Her brain was saying something's wrong, like where there's a wobble. So she reported this to her husband and he thought, well, is this a big deal? Is this an emergency? People have visual stuff all the time. Anyway, so he called and said, can you talk to my spouse for a second? I said, sure. So he started interviewing the patient. This is a couple of years ago. And I said, tell me about the wobble. And within about a minute and a half or so, uh, it was abundantly clear. She had an evolving detached retina Mm -hmm. from the fall. She had, you know, acceleration, deceleration, injury. Even with the helmet on, she managed to detach a portion of her retina. So this is a bit of a surgical ophthalmologic emergency. And this is, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon. And um, so we very quickly kind of went into action. One, stop the uh, no alcohol with lunch because alcohol is a blood thinner, right? Keep your head elevated. We don't want you to lie flat because that'll make the detachment worse. And we don't need an ophthalmologist. We need a retinal surgeon. So we knew, and we had identity, you know, we went into our database for Aspen. We identified an ophthalmologist. He recommended a retinal surgeon. We got a hold of the retinal surgeon. About 45 minutes later, we had an actual, dis, you know, a definitive action plan. Um, and our patient was operated on, had a, a laser reattachment of a retina two and a half hours later. No loss of vision. You know, it's, it's a, obviously it's a serious case, emergency case, um, but very high value. Yeah. Our, our bread and butter cases are generally a, a bit more uh, simple than that, where the focus is on time or, you know, rashes, bug bites, uh, embedded sea urchin spines, you know, it depends <laughs> on what season you're in. You know, we see a lot of Lyme rash, uh, rashes yeah. in May, May, June, and July, we see a lot of Lyme disease all over the Northeast, uh, out to Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, you, you name it. Um, but, this, you know, same, same concept, though. I got a problem. I prefer not to spend a lot of time on this, and I want a definitive transfer of responsibility from me, the client, to you, the doctor. And so speak to that a little bit more. I think that's one thing I've also heard from you over the years that your your practice and what you guys focus on is this idea of the network that you've created and the ability, um, you know, in a, in a positive sense to cut in line. Like when you have an emergency because of the relationships and, and the way that you designed World Clinic, when there's an issue, your focus is being able to get it solved now. So, you know, I know we kind of already went through it in example format, but how did that kind of come about? And, 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 you know, tell me, I guess, just explain more about how you think about that. Sure. Um, again, this, this sort of pre, uh, prejudice or inclination to action that comes with the emergency medicine attitude. Um, and the beauty of emergency medicine, uh, and here I'm going to kind of shine up the specialty is, you know a lot about all the things that can go wrong. In fact, you're tested on it constantly. Uh, and you're warned constantly, if, don't miss this heart attack, don't miss this aortic. It may masquerade as this, it may ma- and on and on. So you have a huge breadth of information about all the terrible things that can happen. That's an awfully good place to start. Couple that with a sense of urgency, you've got your basics covered. Now, it's an interesting journey for me. I've started, you know, we're very emergency medicine based, but the last couple of years, we've brought into our practice group family practitioners. Uh, two reasons: one, our patients have gotten older. We re- we rarely le- a patient rarely leaves our practice because they they like what we do. You know, they're happy and they're loyal. Um, but we're all now twenty years older, and so we really starting to focus a lot more around chronic disease and chronic illness. Um, I'll tell you honestly, we we never feel comfortable saying I can help you cut the line or I can help you jump right. the line. It's like that that sure doesn't feel right. But I can tell you what often does happen. Again, because we start with emergency medicine or the sense of urgency, we are able to carry out physician to physician conversations and speak like 
my ophthalmology uh, ophthalmologist, you know, I called him as an emergency physician said, I, I got a lady with a wobble. I'm, she's acting just like a detached retina. And this physician's like, oh, holy cow. Well, you're going to have to go over there. To, there's a retinal surgeon. He's a wonder, wonderful woman. You, you got to get you got to make get going. Right. So th- you're not jumping the line so much as prioritizing like what needs to happen to take care of this patient, because believe it or not, most docs still want to do the right thing by the patient. They still hold that credo of the patient comes first. Uh, not all docs. Absolutely not all docs. We've met those those jerks. But most docs want to do the right thing. So being able to you know, intake the case and translate it to physician talk yeah. often allows you to expedite care. Um, and, and, uh, and our patients benefit definitely. That cutting the line probably wasn't the right way to frame it, but I think just the ability for you to jump on a call and have that uh, willingness and ability to, to find the right people to talk to, um, to the client or to the patient or client, it feels like they're getting the cut in line, but really it's just your, your network and ability and willingness to jump on the phone. Um, yeah, exactly. They're, they're leveraging a much more efficient means of communication, which we offer, which is doctor to doctor. Yep. So I know when we first started um, hearing about you and World Clinic uh, five years ago, the, the demand was already high, you know, for, for families that travel around the world quite a bit. And you guys would really specialize in creating a unique approach to working with them. And then the pandemic hit uh, a couple of years ago, and you already kind of uh, alluded to earlier, you were already making some level of a shift as your as your patients were getting older. But I think uh, from our conversations, it, it shifted even more with the pandemic. So walk me through how concierge medicine, at least in your level, has evolved and, and how you guys are approaching that and, and how that's changed the industry a little bit. Sure, sure. Well, I'll tell you that COVID really changed almost everything. Um, you know, I talked before about the two models of concierge medicine, sort of office-based versus a distributed telemedicine model. The office-based concierge practice was really heavily handicapped by COVID because of the need for isolation, masking, never having a crowded waiting room, you know, really, really limiting uh, uh, people's proximity and exposure to each other. This put a real hurt on office-based concierge medicine. It also put a real hurt on the concept of going to an emergency room or an urgent care center. So for us, you know, because we start with this virtual interchange as the first point of contact, this was a boon to uh, the fortunes of World Clinic. Um, is an interesting journey. You know our client base, and you know some of them who they are and the, the corporations they they direct. Um, we end up getting corporate clients as a result of this, which had never happened before. It's ninety nine percent of our business is families, um, but some of these funds in particular uh, were directed to us by the owners, founders, managing directors, uh, and we found ourselves taking care of an entire investment fund. Virtual, yeah. virtually, virtually, um, uh, and and this was oftentimes a, a multinational effort, but it um, it worked well. Again, you're you're in this virtual model. Time and space are somewhat independent of of the process, and it works. Yeah, I think that's interesting. Just to you know, again, everybody is different in their needs and wants, but just the benefits of working with a group that started somewhat innovatively into this space and is willing to shift gears quickly when when the needs arise. I think that's a, a powerful um, message that you share on that. Um, I want to shift gears. You know, we, we started with I, I wanted to get um, a general sense of, of concierge medicine just so our our listeners and viewers could um, kind of level set what we mean when we say that. Um, but I want to shift gears and kind of talk about the longevity conversation that Brian alluded to at the beginning. and. You know, as, as he mentioned, uh, and I see it in our clients as they've been, and everybody's recognizing it. We're all we're living longer, generally speaking. Uh, modern medicine has has evolved to allow people to stay alive longer, and and which I think is a great thing. But I, I think they're also seeing the challenges of as you live longer, you run into more issues more often, and and it's really important to them that they actually are living a healthy, fulfilling, active life if they're going to be around a lot longer and and not just have a living. And so. Um, it has all sorts of implications, you know, on the health and the wealth side. I think the wealth side is, you know, easy to identify, you know, as they age and they're living into their nineties, um, when they look at their kids, their kids are now in their sixties and seventies. And so when they do finally pass in their nineties, maybe even get to a hundred, 
that gift, that inheritance is no longer the same impact that it might have been um, if they had died earlier. Um, and so they're, it's important to them that they see that gift happen while they're living. So we're seeing a lot more of our families interested in giving while living, whether it's their family or the causes they care about. The flip side of that is if you're going to live significantly longer, you got to plan for that. How are you going to make sure the money lasts and, and you're going to be able to take care of yourself, especially if health issues come up, which can be very expensive. And so I know that in addition to just concierge medicine in general, longevity planning and the idea around that is something that is really at the core of what you guys are doing for your patients as well. So you know, kind of walk me through how you think of it from the health side of longevity planning, not just the, I guess, the ongoing treatment, but some of the things you guys are helping your patients look for, find that, that for those that are really interested in, in diving deep into longevity planning and making it a healthy experience, what are you guys doing around that? And how do you, how do you view that world? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I, I, before I'm, jump, I'm going to go into the weeds with you here in a second, but I do want to emphasize this, this group of people are very good at making money and return on investment. And when you add a decade to their life, yeah. it, they typically double their portfolio, sometimes triple it. Right. And if you look at, look at uh, Mr. Uh, Warren Buffett, for example, if you look at the, the, the growth curve of his wealth, it's exponential over the last two decades. He's a very, very healthy 90 year old uh, commanding around 100 billion now. That's likely to be 200 billion if he finishes this next decade, which is highly likely because he takes his health very seriously. He's an exerciser, walker. But the point I'm trying to make is think about your health, your longevity, and here I'll be blunt, your lifespan, right? Your expiration date. We want that to be as far out into the future as possible. Well, that doesn't happen by accident. And again, think of this as a portfolio play. What's your risk? Step back from yourself and look at what am I like? What am I likely to die from or be injured from heart disease or cancer? That's that's going to be the route for most of us. A small subset of heart disease of people with stroke, but these are basically with vascular injury versus cancer. So look at your ancestors, your parents aunts and uncles, what did they die of? Or what did they carry for years as a disease state? Um, look at your own genetics that carefully. And I mean carefully, find out, find out, find out, find out in detail. Because I need you to look at risk, to identify risk, because it's going to guide so much of what subsequently happens. So if you came to me and said, oh, actually I just had a patient like this, um, we have a preponderance of breast cancer on a paternal side, on the dad side. Um, I said, well, that's unusual. And so uh, the, our patient, who's a mom, said, well, it was on my dad's side. I don't think I'm really at risk for it. And I said, no, we, we should marker you and find out. And she's turned out to be positive for the BRCA gene, which is a good thing to know when you're 38 years old. And now we'll put you under very close surveillance. That will likely... Um, prevent a cause of death for her because it identified from her genetics a particular gene to test for and she had it. So look at risk very seriously. And then when you've got a handle on what that risk is, are there markers that we can identify? Cardiovascular disease, this is an incredibly well-developed body of knowledge and science. Um, I have a lot of heart disease in my own family I know exactly what my risk factors are. I've actually got a genetic risk factor and I actually have to tweak the usual plan for heart disease for myself, um, not to beyond just exercise and diet to, but to actually include medication and to track a very specific metric in my semi-annual blood work. Point is though, I looked at my risk in detail and then I identified the markers that are gonna predict, am I winning, am I losing, am I falling behind? Um, and I'm managing the hell out of those markers. And that's, that's really the basis of longevity right there. So really it's a, it's proactive, heavily proactive planning, um, obviously doing some research in advance, but not waiting for something to occur and just trying to have better treatment for it, but actually proactively planning for your health, how that diet impacts, how exercise, how all these factors come into play and, and building a, a long-term plan about how to address all of that. Exactly. It's, it's proactive, but it's also personalized. 
It's, yeah. it's, longevity is not one size fits all, I assure you. You've got to get into your own weeds, so to speak, about who, who in your family, who that is genetically related to you, what have they had? Um, and then can we identify specific markers that will help us guide the treatment plan, the management plan, the lifestyle plan? Um, incredibly important. And I'll, uh, one more question on this, and it's kind of related to the question we had earlier about, you know, the not so much cutting in line, but relationships and being able to get on the phone. So even with all this great planning, stuff happens and people get sick and, and, and get unhealthy and, and diseases come up. Um, similar to more of an emergency situation, um, how are some of the benefits of working with a, a high-end concierge practice with the kind of relationships you've developed over the years? What what might be some of the benefits of having access to the medical care you provide in, in those types of scenarios? What what might you be able to do for that? Um, you know, I have to tell you, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a little sad about it, but I'm, it's, it's still a fact. People's access to a doctor is becoming scarcer and scarcer and scarcer. This intermediaries between you and the doctor. And this is why I like concierge medicine because this doctor's making his living off of being available and fulfilling that service requirement. So you get a callback from someone who knows you and who's, who's incentivized to care about you. Um, I really like that model. Yeah. The model I typically see in a hospital system is get the lowest level provider who doesn't know you. Let's try to have them access the records. Let's try to filter you in at the bottom of the system. And then, you know, if you've got anything weird or serious, there's delay, delay, like your friend, delay, yep. delay, and now it's too darn late. Like we may, you've had these symptoms for three months. If, if we had seen this three months ago, we had a chance at your aggressive prostate cancer, breast yep. cancer, or we could have done that cardiac catheterization, you know, the first time you had that nausea while climbing stairs, you know, you thought it was a hangover. No, it's angina. Right. It's it's stuff like that. But if you could call your doc and say, hey, every time I climb my steps, I get really nauseous. The doctor would have said, whoa, hit the brakes. What? Yeah, that's angina. That sounds like exertional angina. I don't like this. Don't climb any stairs. I want you in the office this afternoon. I mean, it's it's foundational to good health care. It's foundational to longevity. So with concierge medicine, you're getting the one thing this system can provide which is access and someone who cares. That's great. Um, I want to shift gears to one more topic, really focused on business owners. But before I dive into that, for, for maybe those in the audience that aren't uh, business owners, um, what's the best way, a couple ideas or, or suggestions you would make for, for someone listening today or watching that is thinking about concierge medicine, you know, maybe a couple ideas on how they should approach the, the, the idea of what makes sense for them. And then two, um, the best way for them to reach out and, and learn more about you and what World Clinic is doing. Okay, so let me give your listeners a little checklist if you're thinking about concierge medicine. There's a lot of concierge medical practices out there. Don't settle on the first one. I want you to go to two or three and interview them. And here's your criteria. Eye contact, time, and what are you going to do about my chronic conditions? And, and what I'm really asking here is, What's the plan for my longevity? Because almost all of us will have chronic conditions as we get older. So that's going to be your, that you, I want you to really focus on that. Are, are you just sort of an, a, you know, a, a urgent care center? That, that's, not, that's not what you should be paying for. You should be paying for longitudinal prevention-based health care. And that's what you want to assess. So what do you do for someone my age who has these conditions that, and I want these optimally managed? And what do you do with regard to prevention and longevity or proactive longevity? And again, like anything, there's a broad quality range, a broad quality range in, in, in among practices. So you are, you are well served to go to two or three, ask these questions, and you're looking for chemistry, and but you're really looking for proactive longevity. Great. And then if, uh, if they're interested in, in maybe more of a virtual telemed option that, that World Connect provides, how could they reach out to you and, and learn more about the options you guys provide? Sure. Um, so if you're looking, I'll tell you the qualifications. I'll tell you who our patients are. They're really mobile, really active, intolerant to delay, um, and 
and they value and respect expertise. Like they really respect it. They're not, you know, they, they know exactly what they're looking for. Um, the, easy, the easiest way to do that is they can call 603-526-9003. That's our office number. Um, a better way is send an email to our head of client services, Alexa Carlin, who's my oldest daughter. A Carlin, A C A R L I N at worldclinic.com. Uh, Alexa grew up in World Clinic. She knows exactly what clients are looking for. Uh, she's quite facile in answering their questions and, and also not wasting their time. In the, and I say by that, I mean World Clinic's a fit for a lot of folks, but there are some folks that we'd say, you know what? No, you need an on the ground patient inside a big, big medical center, or on the ground doctor inside a big, big medical center, because you've got something very serious. And we don't think you should have five homes anymore. We think you should have one home and take that one problem very seriously. Yeah, that makes sense. We're well, going to appreciate um, educating us on concierge medicine in general and, and really diving into the longevity. Um, I do want to switch gears now and really go a little bit deep on a business owner topic. I mean, we could probably spend an entire um, podcast hour on discussing this idea, but it was something you brought up. And I think I first heard about maybe about a year ago that you guys had built and, and it came out of the back end of working with a business owner client that you had as just a concierge medicine uh, patient, but he had a, a re remote business and they were having a, a lot of issues with onsite injuries and dealing with um, the care for those and getting them back um, working again. And you were able to develop a similar concierge medical practice for businesses that have these types of issues and you, you titled it job site care. So um, tell me a little bit how that evolved. And I think um, obviously, I think the business owners listening are very interested in how it impacted the business. But I think just as important how it's impacted the employees uh, of that business yeah. and how they have developed a much deeper level of trust um, with the business and business owners through this process. So tell me about job site care uh, and what that's all about and, and how that evolved. Sure, sure. So, so job site care is a private telemedicine practice whose entire focus is injured workers delivering care at their workplace. So the value proposition is you have an injured worker, don't send them off campus to uh, Ahmed clinic or urgent care or ER. And this, you're sending them to an unmanaged, often uncaring uh, experience. So um, I, I developed a practice model from the bones, from the fundamental principles of World Clinic to care for injured workers. I did this at the behest of one of my World Clinic patients. He's a construction magnet. We, we did a big project together 15 years ago, remote island. I did all the telemedicine with my colleagues. It was a huge success. Um, saved them millions of dollars just managing workers on this remote island so we weren't spending 10,000 bucks to fly every hangnail off, that, that type of thing. He called me back four years ago and said, I want you to do that telemedicine on our remote construction sites. We're building solar fields. We have got vertical projects. We're doing some heavy, really, really heavy construction in remote places. I want you to take care of my workers. And by the way, I want you to fi fix workers' compensation. It's a mess. Yeah. And he said, okay, well, <laughs> let me take a look at it. He was right. It was a mess. But th the model that we developed addresses the, the fundamental problems, which is there's very little accountability on the part of providers for the final outcome of an injured worker. The worker himself or herself experiences long unexplained delays between their care events. They're often miscommunicated or poorly communicated with. Uh, and when they suffer that paradigm, they get angry and they call lawyers. And now it's, oh boy, forget it. You know, indemnity costs, litigation costs, and what, what should have been a $25,000 surgical case is now a $450,000 angry employee case. So I built, uh, I built job site care with the infrastructure of World Clinic. Again, this ability to access a physician now and organize and manage the care wherever the worker is quickly and rapidly. Uh, and then obviously we took on total accountability. So we got accountability. We're making things happen fast. And of course, in telemedicine, you have to communicate all the time because you're not physically in the same rooms. So you're so this has become a huge success story. In fact, my original client and I are laughing about it. He wanted to buy the company two years ago when we got our first six months of performance data. 
He said, what, why, why wouldn't we just buy you? And I was like, I don't know. Why wouldn't you? Uh, I would not make that decision now. <laughs> I would not. I would not affirm that now. It's it's going it's going really well. Um, so, what type of business? Um, what industry specific? You know, number of employees, kind of key issues they're dealing with. What what kind of company makes sense for considering a program like this? Sure. Probably the primary qualifier from the owner's perspective is: Are you self insured? Are you big enough to be self insured for your comp and general liability? Uh, usually that means more than several hundred employees, four or five hundred up to a thousand or so. So big, big company that's self-insured, that's where we start. Then you layer onto that, onto that, is this high risk work? You know, office work is generally not high risk work. Construction, you bet. Oil and gas, mining, trucking and distribution, nursing home and assisted living, timber, lumber, offshore fisheries. Holy crow, do these, these folks get hurt, right? Yeah. So that's where the need is. And the uh, owners of those businesses, they do experience this rather sobering uh, price they pay for not managing, managing these cases well. So self-insured, high risk. They're almost all big companies. Uh, and then finally, I'd say if you're a distributed company, I meaning you got operations in multiple states where you want to have a reasonably um, standardized approach to managing your injured workers or a nice fit for that. Again, we're, we're a distributed model. Uh, and then lastly, and I'm kind of sorry to say this, if you're in a really dysfunctional workers comp state, New York, Illinois, California, Oregon, Washington state, Alaska, we, we have a lot of value because we shortcut this whole process that results in everyone making money off an injured worker. Um, so sorry to say that, but it happens to be very true. Um, yeah. you know, the, the cost of workers comp in New York is four, five, six, ten 10 times greater than the cost of workers comp in a place like Oklahoma, Nebraska. Um, and just getting us on board to see an injured worker on a construction site in Manhattan, right after it happened, I mean, we're radically changing, changing the workers experience. And we're also ch changing the economic experience of the uh, general contractor who's in many cases, they are self-insured for this, this type of stuff. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great story. I've seen the case studies. I know the dollar figure difference it makes for the business owner. And in my world, I, I'm always helping our owners understand, you know, how increased cash flow profits then also translate to value in the company. So those are great. But I also think um, the most, to me, that the biggest, uh, component, uh, when we had the most recent conversation about this was what it does for the workers and their trust and, 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 uh, the way they feel cared for, you know, with this versus uh, a traditional uh, experience. I think that's really important. So, um, kind of like with world clinic, this is, a, I think a separate organization or a separate website. So what's the, if someone is interested in this, I'll always, you know, whether it's world clinic or this, if, if those of you listening want to reach out to me, I can get you in contact, but, but directly, what's the best way for people to learn more about job site care uh, for job site care, really simple. My colleague, Mike Russo is fantastic guy. Um, you can reach him by email M R U S S O M Russo at job com, And you're, you can always email me. I'll, I'm always happy to talk to another business owner. My email is dcarlin, D-C-A-R-L-I-N at jobsitecare.com. Great. All right, Dan, really appreciate your time. I know um, you know very valuable. You, you, you probably have a few uh, patients waiting for you as we, as we <laughs> get off of this. But yeah, just really appreciate your time today um, and uh, learning more about uh, concierge medicine, longevity planning, and then job site care has been great. So appreciate your time. And uh, Ryan? Uh, I'll throw it back to you to uh, to take us out of here. All righty, absolutely. And well, Homer, and before we roll, though, uh, I, you know, one thing that's worth mentioning, I mean, there is this massive wealth management component at, at hand here within concierge medicine and, of course, longevity planning at large. If anybody out there in the audience is interested in, in chatting with you and your team over at Convergent Wealth Partners about the wealth management component specifically, you know, within these fields, what would be the best way they could get in touch with you guys? Yeah, I appreciate that. I think one, one way to think about um, our practice in particular and what we do is, um, you know, we obviously are in the wealth management space. You know, a lot of people think that's really all about the money, but we really think of it as a, a role where we're a coordinator of experts and whatever issues you and your family are dealing with, 
We want to have a network of experts, the very best in the country and the world, who are the right people to deal with for this particular situation. So, you know, on the wealth side, obviously dealing with um, all the numbers around the estate planning um, and the wealth implications, you know, coming directly to us is, is always going to be the best place to start. But also, you know, if you just have questions around concierge medicine and longevity on the health side and just not sure where to go and, and whether reaching out to World Clinic is best or starting locally, you know, always feel free to start with um, reaching out to us at Convergent Wealth, uh, email me or go to our website, and we're always happy to start that conversation and really figure out really what is the best uh, next step for you. Fantastic. Well, like Dan Homer, I know you've got clients to serve. We'll let you get back to doing that, but I appreciate you jumping on board and then diving into this topic of, of concierge medicine and longevity planning. Really been a great conversation today, and uh, I'll see you on the next one, Homer. Thanks, Ryan. It's been great. All righty. Cool. And as always, hey, look, we want to take a final moment and say thank you to our audience for jumping aboard and hanging out with us on the show today. If you took anything away from today's conversation, maybe you benefited from it in any way, shape or form. Do us a favor, hit that subscribe button on whichever platform you check us out on today. And then, of course, share this information with any friends, family, business owners, anybody that you think these conversations would pertain to. You know, uh, the biggest thing, hitting that subscribe button will make sure that you never miss out on a great episode. Uh, you know, and Homer and I obviously are bringing new topics, new wealth management discussions, uh, and, of course, new guests onto this show to get some insight from those professionals in those areas. And we'd hate to have you miss out on any beneficial information for you and yours. So for Homer, for Dan, I'm Ryan. We're going to go ahead and say so long, but we appreciate you hanging out with us today on the installment of Advance Your